So what we're going to learn today is about um, the answer box. So raise your hand if you know what the answer box is or position zero is. Okay, quite a few of you guys. Uh, what about the folks that don't know what that means at all? So if you've never heard of it, raise your hand. Okay, one, two people willing to admit it. What about those of you that are kind of iffy on it? You've heard of it, but you're not really sure what it means or how to use it. Okay, a few more. So by the end of this session, everyone should be able to raise their hand and say, I know what the answer box is. Um, you'll also be able to say why it's important. Um, you'll be able to say, I know how to get there. I know how to make sure that I'm optimized for it. And you'll be able to say, I know how to measure for it. So those are kind of the goals that we've set for this presentation um, today. So what is the answer box? That's our first question. Um, the answer box is called a lot of different names, so I want to clear some things up for you guys. Um, I'm going to use these terms interchangeably as we go through this session. So if I say the word answer box, position zero, featured snippet, instant answer, I'm talking about the same thing. Um, and if anybody else talks about those, they're talking about the same thing. And that thing that we're talking about is this right here. So this is a search result for why can't my kid sleep? And you'll see that um, on this slide, there's this interesting little box up at the top. That's the, that's the uh, instant answer or position zero. And you'll notice also that it's styled a little bit differently from other results on the page. The font is larger. It's kind of highlighted with this shadow around it. And um, the font is actually, or the description is actually above the blue link. So those are some things that are different about it. One other thing I want to mention, because it's going to be important later, is that Children's Health, that's the company I work for, is ranking both for the featured snippet and for the regular organic result that's at the bottom. So just keep that in mind as we're going through. So why is this important? Um, there's a few reasons why it's important. The first one is location, 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 right? We've all heard this phrase talked about, talking about real estate um, from Lord Harold Samuel. And it's important in the real estate on the search engine results page two to be in the right position. If you don't believe me, just ask the people who are showing up in position two or the people who are showing up in position nine that might as well be on page two. Um, those folks know that if you're in the right location, you're going to get the most traffic. So we want to make sure that we're doing that. And to prove that, um, search engine marketing or search engine land did a uh, study about featured snippets. So when there's no featured snippet, the first result on the page gets about 26% of the traffic, 26% of the clicks for a search. Now, when you add in a featured snippet, you'll see that 8% or 8.6% of the traffic goes to the featured snippet itself. And 19.6% of the traffic goes to your first result. So how many of you guys out here are math people, math folks, okay, like one, yeah, I, I, content folks and math folks don't usually mix in the same company, right? So that means that there's 2.2 extra percentage points um, that are going to these first, um, first features on the search engine results page. So if you think back to children's health on that why can't my kids sleep, that means that we're getting 2.2 extra percentage points because we rank in both of those places. Um, and again, if you're not a math nerd, that's an 8.5% growth. How many of you guys would like to grow traffic on one of your pieces of content by 8.5%? Yeah, me too. Everybody likes that. So um, one of the other reasons it's really important is that Gartner and a bunch of other people in research are starting to predict that more and more traffic is going to be done on devices that do not have screens. Gartner predicts that, that's, that it's going to be 30% of the web. Uh, there are some statistics that say up to 50% will be voice searches, not, um, not physical searches on your mobile or your desktop. Um, and so what does that mean? Well, if you live in the second result, or the third result, is it gonna get read out when you do a search on voice? Does Alexa or Google Home read out multiple results? No, they only tell you one, and that one is who lives in the featured snippet or the instant answer. So you wanna make sure you live there as more and more searches start happening on these voice devices. 
So I know what you're saying. You're like, okay, Courtney, I know, I know this is important. You've, you've illustrated that to me. I already knew it was important. That's why I'm here, right? So how can I actually show up there? The first step is keyword research. And you guys have, have all done this before, but I want you to throw away everything you've ever learned about keyword research. I want you to forget about Keyword Planner. I want you to forget about SEM Rush. Sorry, SEM Rush guys. Um, we're going we're gonna to remember them later, but first I want you to forget about them. Because they're holding you back. You've been so reliant on these tools that you've forgotten about the other tools that are sitting right in front of you. And when I say tools, I really mean assets, people that hold lots of information about what is important content for your company that you've forgotten about. So who are these people? Number one, they are clients and customers. In healthcare, which is the sector I work in, sometimes it's hard to get access to these people. So they're not, while, while they're very helpful, sometimes they're not always accessible. If they're not accessible to you, your second, your second, um, your second group should be your sales team, your frontline staff, whoever's working with your customers on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of these people are the most undervalued people in your organization. They're the people that work in your call center. They're the people that answer your phones in the front desk. They have access and information about your customers that folks that are sitting over in a marketing office divorced from where um, your customers are, they don't know this information. So my wife works at JCPenney. The marketing company, the marketing portion of the company doesn't know what the person at, um, at the checkout knows. So we need to get access to these people. That's, that's step one. And we need to ask these people, what questions are our customers and clients asking us every single day? And you need to say, what language are they using when they're asking these questions, right? Because in the marketing world, we get really used to our products and services. We use a lot of jargon, right? Um, especially in really technical fields like SEO. So I, I use jargon all the time when I'm talking internally with folks. And they go, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't know what you're talking about. So I have to step back and explain it. Well, you're going to have to do that with your content too. If you're using words and jargon that your customers are not typing into search, your content's not going to show up. So I want you to take all these notes and I want you to set them aside for a minute. You're going to, sit, you're going to come back to them later. So I want to show you um, something that happens on um, Google when I start taking some of these questions and plugging them into Google. So I'm typing in a search here, does my child have ADHD? So I'm scrolling down to these people also ask questions and I'm starting to open them up. And look what's happening. Every time I click on one of these results, more questions show up. How do you think Google's getting these questions? They're doing something similar to what I just told you to do. I told you to go to your customers and ask them questions. Well, they, they're collecting all of the questions that your customers are asking Google. And they're putting them um, in front of the customer to say, these are some other questions you might ask. Well, it's great for the customer, it's great for the Google user, but it's also great for the marketer. We need to also write down these questions. So take the questions that you found from your sales team or from your frontline staff or from your, call, from your call center, write them down and start inserting them into Google and collect all of those people also ask questions. Next step, you're gonna do some competitor research. So who are your competitors? A lot of people, when I go to them and I say, you need to do competitive research for search, they say, oh great, I've got a list of my competitors, I'll send them over to you. And they send me a list of the people that work in the same sector that they work in. So for children's health, that might be Texas Children's, or it might be Cook Children's, which is in Fort Worth. Um, but the problem is that on search, the competitors that you have in the real world aren't necessarily the competitors that you have in search. So whoever your competitor is, is the person who is ranking for the featured snippet that you want to rank for. For us, a lot of times that's Wikipedia. Sometimes it's WebMD, sometimes it is LiveWell and these other content producers. That's our competitor in this case. So what we're going to do is start typing in these, um, these searches and writing down the folks that are showing up for them when we want to be showing up. 
and we're gonna start looking for patterns. We're gonna say, okay, what's the format? Is Google displaying this in a bulleted list? Are they displaying it as a paragraph? Are they putting it in a table? Um, you're gonna start making conscious notes about those patterns that you see. What words and phrases are they using? So again, the words and phrases that your customers are using, are you seeing those same patterns and the words and phrases that are being used on these sites that are ranking for the featured snippets you wanna rank for? What's the length of the answers? Are they really long? Are they really short in one sentence? You're gonna write all this stuff down and you're gonna put it next to the pile of questions that you had before. So I like this example because it illustrates that just because you see um, a theme for one particular search, it doesn't mean that it will be the same for a similar search. So this is a search for acetaminophen doses for children. And you see that Google has chosen to present this in a table and that's what they're liking for it. You do the same search, but for Adderall and they're putting it in a, in a paragraph. So they're having a different preference. Now, this could mean that there's really no other good answer for Adderall doses for children. Um, in which case they're just sort of using the best thing they have. You'll discover that in your, um, in your research because one of the other things you're going to be writing down is how are my competitors failing? What are the things that they're doing poorly that I can start taking advantage of? Third thing, content ideation. So you've got this pile of questions. You've got this pile of competitive research. What do you do with it? The first step is you're going to be starting to build themes. So all of the content ideas, you know, let's say that we're writing about um, why can't my kids sleep. So you might start writing, um, you might start seeing a bunch of questions about uh, home remedies for insomnia. So anything that has to do with a home remedy, you're going to start pulling it together, okay? And then you might see um, themes around night terrors, okay? Questions about night terrors. Lots of kids get night terrors. So you're going to start grouping those things together and you say, okay, great. What assets can I start to think of um, for these different topics? This is what you're doing regularly, but how many of you guys skip all of this consumer research and you go straight to brainstorming, right? Most content groups don't do any of this research. They start brainstorming internally about the things that they want to write about. So this is a constant struggle at Children's, right? We go into our content brainstorming meetings and folks say, well, this is what um, the doctors want to write about. And that's great. We want to write about those things. Um, but we also want to make sure it's answering the, the um, questions that our consumers have. Step four, content planning. So now you've got these different themes. They're grouped together. And you've got to start figuring out, OK, is this a series? Is this a podcast? Is this a uh, single blog post? Well, how is this going to fit into your calendar? And that's going to matter a lot based on the themes that you guys see, right? So um, are the folks that are showing up in these results answering all the questions in one blog post? Or are they going really in depth in this question in really long form content um, that's broken up over a series? So you're going to go back to those patterns and you're going to see, OK, what, what were people doing here? I'm going to mimic that. Then you're going to do your content development and optimization. So the best thing that you can do, this is the number one thing. If you don't write anything else down from this entire presentation, if you forget about all of it, this is the most important thing. The questions that you are answering in your content need to be structured as H2s. Raise your hand if you know what an H2 is. Okay, almost everybody. There's a few of you that are shaking your heads, right? So an H2 is just HTML markup to tell it it's a heading. So your, your H1 is your title. Your H2 is a subtitle. These questions need to be structured as H2s or H3s. The reason is Google is not a human. They can't see that you've made the font size bigger. They can't um, guess that you're answering that question there. They have to have some sort of clue, and the H2 is that clue. So they're going to be looking for that, number one, the question in the H2 or the question as a heading. Number two, and this is also important, you need to take the content and you need to remember from your research, how was it structured? How was my competitor structuring it? And you need to immediately after the H2, put your answer to the question in the, using the, um, cons the research that you had before. So if, it, if, it, if Google likes a paragraph, put it in a paragraph. If Google likes a table, put it in a table. Um, and then 
you're going to ask yourself, okay, what was my competitor doing poorly? Were there misspellings? Um, did they miss out on going into um, an explanation about an acronym that they used where they could have explained that acronym fuller? What, what are they doing poorly? And sometimes the questions that your, um, that your customers are asking, your sales team, um, will help to, to um, inform these decisions. What content is missing from these questions? Okay. Oh, I had, the, I had a whole slide for that. Uh, step six is technical optimization. So how many of you guys have heard of structured data or schema.org? Okay, maybe like 20% of you guys, so not very many. Okay. Um, if you're not very technical, a lot of this may go over your head, but you need to understand the value of it so you can go back to the folks on your team that are technical and explain to them what you need and why you need it. So structured data is basically markup or HTML that goes around your content to give Google clues about what that content is. So um, there is structured data for everything from reviews to frequently asked questions, to articles. Um, you're going to want to make sure that you've put structured data around your um, content. Number two, you're gonna wanna make sure that your content is crawlable. Um, you know, you're gonna wanna go to your, your SEO, your technical SEO resources and say, okay, have I done everything I possibly can to make sure that the site map for the health and wellness library that we have is, is indexing all of our pages, that everything's there, um, that it's marked up correctly. You're going to want to make sure, um, for example, when I came on board at Children's Health, um, the title tag for each of our articles, um, the one that we had written inside of our content management system was not what was showing up in the, um, the actual page. So Google was indexing the wrong words. So we had spent all this money and time and energy optimizing title tags, and they weren't showing up. You're, you need to be prepared to do some spot checking on these things. So as you're publishing articles, go and check and make sure that the right things are showing up.